I'm with you and Murray. You and you've got a very long history of connection with Walton Heath. Can you just tell me how you came to to be assistant pro and and touring pro at the club? Well, I had a very good final year as a as a boy in 1971. I turned pro fairly early at 17. Uh, the first year didn't go according to plan. Uh, I was quite small. I wasn't really fully developed to go and play full time on tour. And the golf wasn't anywhere near as good in 72 as it was the previous year. So my father said, it's time for you to, to leave home, which is the way things were in these days. And I applied for the job. Uh, it was advertised in Golf Illustrated. And I applied for the job. Uh, I got a, an answer back from Wing Commander Bill McRae, who was the secretary then, became my boss and very close friend. And I had to go down and do uh, an interview, which was playing golf with uh, a chap called Benny Drayson, who was a very fine golfer uh, at Walton Lake, John Thornhill, Jill Thornhill. The second round was with Bill McRae, uh, Colin Walpole and Tudor Davis. And then I went home and a letter duly arrived saying that you've been successful in your application. And on the 22nd of April, 1973, I departed Turnhouse Airport in Edinburgh, bound for Tadworth and Surrey. So that's how it started. And and how did you mix working at the club with being a, a, a tour professional? That was very difficult because I had two weeks teaching, two weeks in the shop uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, and then two weeks tournament. So it wasn't the ideal preparation for tournament golf. But I fell in love with Walton Heath almost immediately. Uh, I met so many wonderful people there that were, they were gracious to me. They, were, they looked after me, uh, always invited me out uh, for dinner or playing golf or, or whatever. And I began to enjoy that life more than actually playing in tournaments because in these days, Tournament prize funds were, were nowhere near the level they are today in comparison. So if you didn't finish in the top 10, it was difficult to, to make a profit. And I just got to enjoy Walton Heath so much. Uh, the golf courses as well, uh, the green staff. Fred Julik was the, the greenkeeper when I arrived. Uh, Clive Osgood, of course, came after him, and, and they were very close friends as well. I just felt that Walton Heath had become my second home. My first one, obviously, alongside my parents growing up, but I grew into Walton Heath uh, and the ethics of, of Walton Heath very quickly and, and was very close to them. And, and tell me a bit about that um, schoolboy career, because it, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I was scratch player at 13, which was quite difficult in these days because the categories were, were strange. You needed five or six cards to come down a shot once you've gone into Category 1. So my father was a professional at Babberton in Edinburgh, about five miles west of the city. So I spent all my youth at the golf club, practising, playing. Golf was my life. Uh, by the time I got to 15, I was still under five feet in height. So, so a tiny lad. And I got to the final of the British boys uh, at uh, Hillside. And the home internationals were before that, and I'd been picked for Scotland at 15 uh, in the boys. I lost the final one up, the 36 hole final. The following year, I won the Scottish boys at North Berwick. I won the Scottish boys stroke play at Lanark. I won uh, over in America at Torrey Pines in the World Junior Championship, age groups. And the last tournament I played in was uh, at Kurnusti. That was the Crow's Nest Tassie, which is still going today. And I beat David Gregg in the final. David was Mr. Kurnusti then uh, and still is today. So I was a bit like the, the lad who shot Bambi. But uh, it was a very special week, and, and that was the last time I played as an amateur. So November the 1st, uh, 72, I turned profession. So once you you joined Walton Heath and you were playing there. How, how did it all pan out from, from then on? Did you need a, a few years to get to the point where you felt more comfortable out on, on tour? I did. I needed uh, until 
had he retired. Uh, I wanted to be the club professional at Walton Heath. Um, that's how much I enjoyed being there. But I was young. I was, I was 23 years of age, 22 years of age. So that was never going to happen. Ken McPherson from Kingswood got the job. My father started Ken playing at George Watson's College uh, in Edinburgh. So I was pleased to see Ken there, and, and that's when I became the tournament professional for Walton Heath. So gone with the duties uh, of teaching so much. I still did some, but gone with the duties uh, of the pro shop. So I then had a chance to concentrate uh, on my own career, my playing career. And that month I, I won a tournament in Nigeria, which was £1,500. Uh, not very much, but it, it was a fortune then. And I then won the Northern Open uh, a month after that up at Royal Dornoch. That was a £1,000 first. And with that money, I was able to put a down payment on a flat in Sutton. Um, and I stayed there for the best part of seven, eight years. But I, I was playing more often. Uh, and I was playing in America, uh, in South America. Africa for about 12 weeks a year because back then the, the European season was only six or seven months so you had five months where you were doing nothing and I had a contract with a, an airline British Caledonian Airways and I was able to go to South America for nothing and do the same in, a, in Nigeria, Zambia, Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, places like that uh, with my expenses paid so 1980, I won the Zambian Open, which is probably the best win I had. It was a strong field on a, a difficult golf course. Um, I think Brian Barnes was, was second there, Mark James. And then I won in Nigeria in 84, which financially was the, the biggest. That was £25,000 first, which then was a fortune. I actually bought another house with that prize money. After that, my father died. He, he died in uh, 1985, a young, 60 years of age. And part of the enjoyment and the, the dedication that, that I had went with him. And, and that was a very difficult period from 85 through to 89, when I eventually lost my tour card. I went back to the school, didn't get it. And that was the end of my 16-year association with Walton Heath, because there's no point in having a, a tournament professional who can't play tournaments. So I realised that was the end there. Um, I was very fortunate then to fall into a second career in television. When you say fall into, how, how, how did that come about? <laughs> I was in Brian Barnes's shop in, in West Chilterton, where I live. And, and Brian, at that point, was... It was not a good time to speak to him at lunchtime because he'd, he'd had a few, let's say. And I I answered the phone and it was a, a Scottish chap called Andrew Miller who was based over in Dubai. And he said I was hoping to talk to Brian so he'd do the commentary for the Dubai Desert Classic of 1990. Boulders Brass, I said, well, I'll do that. You don't, you don't need Brian to do that. I'll do that. Having a laugh with him. And he said, well, that's fine. We'll send you an air ticket. And I went over to Dubai, 500 pence the fee was for four days, six hours live on my own to a satellite station uh, called Channel 33, Arabic cameraman who'd never covered golf before, Arabic director and producer who'd never covered golf before. And the first hour, we saw people swinging but never saw the golf ball. And they said, they said, how's things going? And, and I thought, well, they're going pretty well, but it'd be quite nice if we, we saw the ball and where it finished. And Oh, we can do that. And by the weekend, their coverage, after two days of that, their coverage was as good as the coverage you see today. Uh, they became great friends. Um, Hamid Mubarak was the, the man who put it all together, the producer. So I did my 24 hours on my own with a lot of Arabic voices in my ear and thought, well, this is a bit more difficult than I, than I thought it was going to be. And that was it. That, that was the first, the first week's commentary. And 
Sky uh, Sky's channel then, the sports channel, was Eurosport. And they bought the pictures with the commentary on it. And then Eurosport got all the BBC events to run alongside the BBC. And they asked if I would do the commentary. I was on a three-month trial. In these days when the programme started, you couldn't see you couldn't see what they call the titles, the opening opening three minutes or so of the program. That was all talked to you through your ear by someone in Holland, because it was done in five different languages. Um, that was difficult, but I had a brilliant producer uh, who was a journalist, uh, Birmingham lad, John Killeen, and he saw me through it. He he knocked some of the rough edges off. Not all of them, I would say, but some of them. And every evening he'd sit down and say, you need to keep this. What you did there was really good. You need to get rid of this. And that went on for 18 months. And then Rupert Murdoch, uh, who on Sky at the time uh, uh, went through a difficult financial period and he sold Eurosport to TF1, which is the equivalent of BBC One in France. And I had to go there and do the commentary for a season, which I didn't enjoy much, flying over to, well, flying over there every Friday night and coming back every Monday morning. And, that. and no, no, but the, the, the commentary was uh, was done from one of the oldest streets in Paris, the Rue cognac Chez, not far from the Eiffel Tower. And they weren't really into golf. And it was just difficult. And another network started up. Meanwhile, it was called the European Sports Network under the name of Screen Sport. And I got uh, I got headhunted for Screen Sport to work alongside Alex Hay. And we worked there for a year until uh, they went bust. And amazingly, after that, within six weeks, Sky Sports started. Um, I, and that's the Sky Sports we know today. Yeah, yeah. So you've been with them a long time now. Ever since that day in uh, 1992. Uh, we got our first event in in 93. Uh, we, we started getting one or two PGA Tour events. We had five events on the European Tour. So I covered probably somewhere around 20 events with David Livingston, who was with Sky for many years as well, uh, 20, 26 years, I think, in all for David. And I remember the first time we went in the studio and said to David, look, I don't know much about this television, Mark. I'm okay with, with commentary, but cameras in the studio and, and lights, and I don't know what camera's on. It's close up of me or a two shot. And he says, well, I don't know anything about golf. So he says, if you stick to the golf and I stick to the, the television studio, he says, we should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and it lasted 26 years before David died a couple of years back. It was it, it was absolutely fine. Now you you actually um, uh, as a boy golfer you played with um, Howard Clark and um, in fact your your careers were, were quite parallel, weren't they? Yeah, Howard and I started at 14 um, a trial for Scotland and England boys. We. Had the best scores, 68 out of 69 myself, playing the Dunbar, a good golf course. But in these days, you know, if you went to a certain school and it wasn't one of these approved schools, let's say in inverted commas, then you were tended to be overlooked. It's a terrible thing to say and a horrible thing to look back on. But Howard and I were in the same boat. Uh, I don't know what school Howard went to, but it was very similar to, to the one I went to in Curry, just outside Edinburgh. And we felt the following year, how it became British Boys Champion in 1971. That was the same week as I was in America playing in the World Junior Championship, having got there through winning the Scottish Boys Stroke in match play. And I remember us having a chat. We didn't get picked for the senior team, which we felt we were good enough. Uh, certainly, um, I think both of us thought both of us thought that at the time. So we turned pro early and things were different and difficult then too. My father being a club professional in these days didn't earn an awful lot of money. It was expensive to play the amateur tour, which obviously would have been the next step. 
so we decided to turn pro and it was difficult for Howard at the start and it was difficult for me. We were too young. We, were, we weren't fully developed. We were too young to, to face a full season on tour. And, and what's it like commentating on people you know really well, particularly you know, when, they do, when they do really well or when things don't go so well for them? Is it difficult to get rid of your own emotion? When I started commentating, I obviously knew all the players fairly personally on tour because I'd played alongside them for, for so long, for 15, 16 years. The, the most difficult one I found was the Ryder Cup at Oak Hill in 1995 because they were the players that I'd grown up with, uh, the likes of, of Nick Faldo. Uh, Sam was a very close friend, Sam Torrance. Uh, Howard Clark, obviously involved in that team as well, and and Seve. I spent a lot of time with Seve. I, I was privileged to be one of his close friends. And Seve was at the end of his career then, and, and now we know why he was struggling with with the problems he had. He played poorly that week, and and yet took Tom Lehman to the turn in, in Old Square. Howard Clark with his hole in one against Peter Jacobson at the eleventh uh, on route to winning there. Mark Jones was a, another one in that team. Um, so all of these were, were my close friends. Europe had never come back from the position they were in on Saturday evening. Bernard Gallagher, who was my first idol as a, as a 10-year-old boy, we, we grew up in the same time. He'd lost on two occasions at Keogh Island and the Belfry. Um, so to see that comeback, on that Sunday, it was, was uh, emotional. I felt probably what they felt uh, at the end. And Faldo's four at the last will go down as one of the, the greatest moments ever in the Ryder Cup because if he doesn't get down in two from 94 yards, Europe are not going to win the Ryder Cup because they didn't hold it. They'd lost it uh, in 93 at, at the Belfry. So a very emotional uh, afternoon, very emotional 12 singles matches. Uh, some of these players were towards the end of their career, I would say the autumn of their career, and they produced fabulous golf over the 18 holes and, and in the end got it done. So that was extremely difficult. Um, otherwise, not, not, not so. The Ryder Cup's always got, uh, it's always got emotion in it. it, it, it it drains you over the three days because you're on air all day. You're there at four o'clock in the morning and you, you leave at eight, nine o'clock at night. So that was always going to be an emotional week anyway, but it, it was more so because of the players I was talking about. It's interesting, isn't it? Because if you look at other sports, there's sports like motor racing where Murray Walker choked up when Damon Hill won the world championship and, and, um, Sue um, at uh, Wimbledon with Andy Murray. Um, it, it's the way now, isn't it, that commentators tend to be former players and, and people who are, are in connection. So to hold it together is, is pretty impressive, I feel. Yeah, um, I remember Murray Walker uh, struggling through that and didn't think much of it at the time. But then, of course, with a few years' experience, you understand why it was like that. Um, he and James Hunt were such a, a great combination. I played a lot of golf with James at Walton Heath and Sunningdale. Uh, I adored James Hunt. I, I thought he was uh, an amazing person, uh, full of brashness uh, behind the wheel, but he was the opposite away from that. Uh, fairly insecure lad. Um, Andy Murray winning, of course, anyone who plays tennis would have shed a few tears, I'm sure, when when all that happened. But that sport, and that's what we're missing right now. We're missing the involvement in it, uh, the emotion of it, the, the joy, the despair, everything that sports gives us. Yeah, exactly. There's a huge change in golf, hasn't there, since, since you turned pro and um, uh, now in, in terms of understanding of the human body, in, in terms of the way... Uh, the pros swing the swing the club. I remember 
um, my mother-in-law saying to me when she hosted some um, some pros of whom you were one um, that they were invited to go and have a swim at the local swimming club and and, and said no 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 we can't go swimming because we might build up the wrong muscles that's right <laughs> that's absolutely true they, I remember growing up my father stopped me swimming and saying that you your upper arms will get too strong. And the big thing then was from the elbow to the hands, you needed to be strong there, according to them. It's, it's changed dramatically. If you look at uh, diets as well, um, sports psychology uh, is another. Um, swings, certainly. You mentioned that a few moments ago. We all swung in what was a reverse C, where there was a lot of pressure on your, your lower back. Uh, Tom Kite was probably one of these players who had the biggest reverse C that, that you would see. And later on in his life, he changed it. Tom Watson was another who had that reverse C. If you look at all the old pictures of him winning the Open at Canusi and, and winning also in that duel in the sun at, at Turnberry, uh, big reverse C. And, and you look at players of my era, they all have back problems. And I think the modern player, when they get to our age, won't have it. So there's been dramatic steps forward. Um, you look at club professionals now, like uh, your own Simon Pfeiffer, a uh, brilliant coach, uh, a man dedicated to, to being a good coach. And he's going to teach all the youngsters, including the, his young girls, he's going to teach all the youngsters the right way. And golf will get better. Players will get better. When I played, there was maybe a dozen or 15 players that could win each week. If you look at today's tour, there's 75 to 90 that are more than capable of winning. Equipment's had a lot to do with that. It's brought the average player certainly much closer to the top player. And that's another reason we have so many players in contention at any given tournament. But they're all steps in the right direction. And I'm sure if you talk to... Andy Murray about the, the changes in tennis from from the days back in Rod Laver uh, and all these days, McEnroe and Connors, whatever. I'm sure he'll tell you the same. Uh, there have been dramatic changes in, in technology and most of them for the good. So I, I think you're thinking of penning your, uh, your memoirs or a book at least, aren't you? And um, when you look back, what do you think will be the standout moments for you? I suspect you might have some more to come yet, but um, <laughs> up until now. Um, Playing-wise, the, the year I was 16, uh, golf came very easy to me. Uh, playing golf came very easy. Then I had putting problems. Um, I talked about winning the, the Northern Open at Royal Dorna. I was having terrible putting problems at that time. And, and Harry took James Blake's putter out of the glass case that you have in the, in the clubhouse, unknown to anyone else, obviously. And I used that putter in the Northern Open. But the signs were still there. I, I was five shots clear, gone up the 18, so under no pressure whatsoever. I hit two bus and woods onto the par 4 18 to around four and a half, five feet. And I left the putt six inches short and seven inches right, dead straight putt. So the problems were there then. The year or the months after that, I played with a chap called Orville Moody, who won the, the US Open in 69 at the Champions Club in Texas. And Orville had a putter that went up the inside of your left forearm, the one that Matt Kutcher uses today. Uh, and one or two others, uh, Webb Simpson uh, is another one. And I used that putter for 10 years, and it helped me. It didn't make me a great putter, but it made me a, a good enough putter to go ahead and have good performances. So from the euphoria of, of the 16 to the struggles to the loss of card, that will all be in the book. Um, the feeling of, of being ashamed you couldn't, overcome these problems, as Bernard Langer did, uh, and one or two others as well. That stays with me, because I think we, as human beings, we tend to look at the, the black side of things, the dark side of things, and not always the positive things. Uh, so 
that will uh, I'll, I'll certainly address that. Uh, the second career is an awful lot more joyous. Uh, there's been uh, some great moments there. The, the Ryder Cup uh, Valderrama was uh, was a great occasion because Seve been so close to him and and in Spain uh, winning that. The Ryder Cups will will feature for sure in the the second section of the book because Sky had them from ninety five to this current day. Uh, major championships, uh, the Masters. We've had since 2011, so there's been some great masters since then, and Schwarzer won that year. And going on to the likes of Danny Willett and Sergio Garcia and European players um, winning that. Uh, the majors, uh, again, the other ones, Rich Beam, my sidekick. I never thought for one moment in 2002, as he was staring Tiger Woods down, Woods birding the final four holes, uh, and Rich just staying out in front, a chap that was selling car stereos only three or four years before that. That will certainly stand out. And the success that, that he's had over the course uh, of his television career before he heads to the Champions Tour. And the Open. Uh, the Open was the last major that, the, that Sky got, the first of these at Royal Troon in sixteen. One of the great Open championships were Henrik Stenson and Phil Nicholson. The 62, the first 62 shot the following year at Birkdale. But the highlights are not so much mine. They're, they're more the games, um, the way the game has changed, uh, what we've discussed over the last few moments, uh, and where it will go from here. So is it all rosy in, in the world of golf, do you think, from here? I think the game was in a very good place before this virus turned up. Um, horrible pace. Um, we we did the first day at the Players' Championship at Sawgrass. And, of course, the second day, that was the end of it. That was the last action they've had. And we don't know when the next action is going to be. But but up until that time, the majors were good. Uh, the players in the top 10 of the world ranking, the ones that had come through, the likes of John Ram, McElroy making his way back there, uh, both great adverts for, for golf and their countries. So uh, I think golf was in a, a tremendous place. Plenty of sponsorship, which we may not see when we come back, depending on how long this is going to be. Um, and just so many good players, so many good young players coming through. And, and the way the European Tour has grown in that time, and who would have thought we'd, we'd have several Finnish players on tour and, and players who are playing well, Sweden burst onto the scene in the late 70s, 80s. We've got great players from there now. And every time you look at a, a leaderboard uh, on the European Tour, or indeed now the PGA Tour, which wasn't always the case many years ago, it was a closed shop then, you have truly international leaderboards. We have players from the Far East that are, are winning events. So the game was in great shape. Uh, what's going to happen when we come back, uh, none of us knows. We just have to wait and see how all this develops. And and coming back to home now, how often do you get to, to play Walton Heath nowadays? I've seen you out there with Robert Lee on occasion. Do you, do you get to play very, very much? I've played, uh, I think, a couple of times with Robert uh, Walton Heath. I've also played, I'm a member at Liphook as well. And we've played there uh, with one or two others, Jamie Spence, who also works alongside us. Um, I talked about the back trouble of the swings we had back in that time. And, and I, I do have a back problem and there are some days when I'm not able to play, but there's other days when I have better days. And I would like to go out and play more often, but it's rather like a busman's holiday sometimes. If you've had a run of four or five tournaments, perhaps the last place you want to go is the golf course spin. but I still stand on that first tee at Walton Heath and, and have butterflies because I'm there. Well, Ewan, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you ever so much for talking to Hold Up, which is our uh, communication with the Walton Heath members, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at Walton Heath in the very near future. Well, I'll always look to go going back home, as I, I call it, Dad. 16 terrific years 
it well they uh some with success some without success but always with enjoyment um, as butch harman says walton he's one of the great golf clubs of the world and not too many would disagree with that <laughs>